good morning, and uh, we'll get uh, started. Uh, although we have uh, President uh, Chisano is going to be a few minutes late, and he's going to join us. Um, I'm not. We are a little squeezed in time. We, in fact, have to spend 10 minutes, uh, conclude 10 minutes earlier than we anticipated. So I'm not going to do uh, a lot of introductions. Everybody knows pretty much everyone on the panel. So I would just uh, welcome my fellow, fellow panelists and get right on into the discussion. Uh, let me just uh, make a couple of opening remarks and then uh, uh, we will have each of our panelists make uh, their opening remarks, three to five minutes, and we'd really love to have some give and take discussion. Uh, as all of you know, that there's been just an unprecedented level of funding and attention to global health in the last three to five years. That's really good news. And lots of innovation in terms of how we approach it has uh, been tried. I mean, Global Fund itself, with uh, uh, Tommy Thompson as chairman and Richard Feacham, uh, here as uh, uh, leading it is a innovation. Uh, the Gates Foundation has been involved in many, many alliances uh, that are truly, uh, again, innovations in, uh, in this field. The civil society, the private sector, uh, as uh, Mark Moody Stewart will talk about, uh, has been doing interesting things and in innovative approaches uh, to add to it. So the question we are really in this panel debating about is how do we make sure all this investment, all this innovation really has the returns? And what are some of the issues that uh, we are dealing with in making sure the returns are there and they are increased? Um, one thing I'll just, I'll position three or four issues and, and I hope that uh, the, my fellow panelists will uh, address some of them and give their perspective on them. One is that while all this money has been pledged, the pace of disbursement is actually not that high, if you really look at it. And I don't know whether it's uh, the, the mechanisms and how we have structured it, or is it also the absorptive capacity in where we are trying to get the money to, and thinking really about whether that money can be very effectively, very fast put to use. A second issue is that while it's great news that a lot of resources are being pledged, if you hear all the experts and so on, the amount of money that is really needed is much greater. There is a gap between what's been pledged and what is needed. So that's kind of another issue. A third one is invariably we talk a lot about AIDS. It's important to talk about AIDS because it is absolutely the most important uh, health issue facing many, many countries. But the point question is that you know, AIDS, on one hand, has raised the visibility, attracted a lot of funding, but there are lots of other diseases that with, you know, are actually maybe not getting as much attention as they could, and they are very serious, they could be solved. The return on resources invested to, to eradicate those diseases, like malaria, for example, uh, could be much higher. And the last one I'd say is that while all this money is flowing, it's flowing from many, many different organizations, uh, certainly uh, the U.S. government, certainly the Global Fund, uh, certainly the Gates Foundation, and many companies all around the world are pulling in resources. But is it all getting coordinated, or are we tripping over each other in terms of how that money is being spent, and are we doing it well? That's another issue that, are, that I'd pose. So let me just, uh, with that, uh, starts with start with uh, Bill Gates in terms of some of your perspectives on the issues. Well, thanks. It's uh, great to be here at Davos and uh, talk about world health uh, because I think this last year was a year of really excellent progress. And it's just this week that uh, the Congress passed a bill that's got the U.S. stepping up its involvement. The first money is part of the. Uh, $15 billion pledge the president made related to AIDS and a significant uh, allocation for the global fund. Uh, so, you know, I think it is fantastic. This is still an issue that relative to its importance uh, from a, a moral point of view or helping societies uh, get uh, going in the right direction doesn't uh, get what it deserves. And 
there are a lot of com complexities uh, that were referred to in terms of the different organizations involved in these activities. Uh, the first uh, area that the, uh, our foundation got very involved in was vaccines. And uh, that's gone very well. The Gavi approach was pretty novel when it was first done, uh, but we've seen increased commitments uh, from various countries and very good results there. Uh, we need some of the new vaccines to come into the package. We need to reduce the 30 million that aren't getting covered. But you know, vaccines, and that, that is a, a pretty incredible story. Uh, in terms of science advances, uh, that's one area that I, I personally feel is uh, still a, a big missing element. Basic research in biology is funded fairly aggressively worldwide, particularly by a National Institute of Health. But then taking those advances and coming up with drugs for uh, diseases that are prevalent in the largest part of the world, that is not in the rich countries, uh, just doesn't happen. That's a missing piece, uh, something the foundation has really tried uh, to help fill in there and fund a lot of people who uh, can uh, do the drug development and go get those trials done. Uh, the trials are complex and expensive. Uh, there's a lot of fine-tuning that could be done there. Uh, when we think about AIDS, uh, there are many important elements. Uh, the, the treatment activity, uh, you'll hear more about it uh, from some of the people here. It's an amazing thing. But what we really need is to stop new people from being infected. And uh, although prevention messages uh, have some impact there, the most dramatic thing would be to have a microbicide or a, a vaccine that would really uh, stop the spread. And until that happens, uh, until one of those comes along, and probably the microbicide would be first in the five, six year time frame, uh, you know, the disease is going to get more widespread. I mean, just ask, uh, you know, an expert what do they think is going to happen in Nigeria? Uh, what do they think is going to happen in India? There's a lot of countries that are still at very low prevalence today that the likelihood that we can keep uh, the disease at low prevalence um, is, is not very high. You know, the disease is spreading uh, despite uh, some great efforts uh, that are going on there. In terms of you know, overall efficiency, uh, you know, I love the fact that we're drawing in a lot of smart people uh, to think about these problems. I don't think the human capacity element is, is as well discussed or well understood as it should be. Certainly when I went to Mozambique, uh, one of the most stunning things was you know, when I first got in the car to go drive around, uh, they said, yeah, you'll meet about uh, 20 doctors today. And so you will have met uh, about 5% of the doctors in this country. And I said, no, that can't be right. You've got 20 million people here. Um, you know, there must be a couple zeros missing. And they said, no, no, no. Uh, there's 400 doctors. Uh, and you know, I said, wow, that is, uh, it brings a real dimension to the idea of what would it be like to have a broad AIDS treatment campaign or you know, some of the malaria uh, types of things that, that need to go on. Uh, so, you know, pretty daunting, uh, but pretty exciting the progress that's taken place. One last thing I'll mention is the uh, uh, progress on the announcement we made last year, which was called the uh, Grand Challenges. Uh, that was a $200 million uh, grant uh, that uh, brought together a group of scientists to say, what are the advances that would save the most lives? And so they came up with 14 different things and published that uh, in October. And so it was things like being able to distribute vaccines without having to refrigerate them or being able to change mosquito genetics so that mosquitoes don't pass along disease. Uh, things that nobody's really funding today. And yet, uh, after we published those 14 challenges, we got over 1,500 applications where people from 85 different countries came to us with ideas that uh, could address each of those 14 challenges. 
And so drawing out the IQ and the energy uh, outside of the normal sort of market mechanism, but just saying to people, you know, any ideas you have really should be pushed forward, uh, I know a lot's going to come out of that. And so although, like everyone, I'm daunted by these world health things, uh, there's two things that keep me very optimistic. Uh, the first is the scientific progress, and the second is just going out in the field and meeting the people who are uh, putting these things together. I, I was in Botswana uh, three months ago seeing the, uh, what's called ASHAP, which is the uh, AIDS treatment program in that country that's scaled up to over 10,000, which uh, relative to what's been done previously is pretty significant. Relative to the need, it's, it's just... Uh, uh, a scratch uh, in the surface, but it was amazing to see the doctors there and see what kind of innovative approaches they'd taken and, you know, to meet some of the patients who were literally on the edge of, of death who, uh, through this program, had uh, returned to lead healthy, productive lives. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, as you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier was uh, not only the resources that uh, Bill uh, alluded to in terms of what uh, the programs of the foundation and governments and so on, but I think one of the major trends that has happened is that the involvement of the private sector in uh, uh, getting uh, together with many of these programs to make them more e effective, extend them, and so on. And Anglo-American and Mark Moody Stewart has been a great advocate of it. Maybe I can ask Mark now to say a few words. Fine, thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to, if you look at the role of, of corporations in developing countries uh, and what sort of corporations are there, those corporations deliver three things, basically. They, they deliver capacity, uh, capa build capacity in people, they generate uh, revenue, and they develop infrastructure. If you go to even the poorest sub-Saharan African country without uh, natural resources uh, being produced, without mines, without uh, oil and gas extraction, you will see fuel distribution. You will see a shell, Total Fina, Elf, uh, Ajip. You will see beverage distribution, Coca-Cola, Heineken, Guinness. Uh, you will see life necessities, Procter & Gamble, Unilever. Uh, you may see telecommunications or, or, or utility, depending on whether these have been, been privatized or not. Now, every one of those corporations has learned how to train people, to develop dealer networks, to train the dealers, to put systems in place, to distribute products and collect revenue and they've managed to do it in what you might call leak-proof ways, because if they didn't do that, they wouldn't make money, and if, if, if it, they couldn't make a living, they wouldn't be there. And those uh, distribution systems are something which is, is needed if we're to get health in those same uh, countries. Secondly, if you go to countries where there are perhaps larger infrastructure activities, mines or major oil fields, then you will see that in relation to, to those operations, or for example in, in Mozambique, the, the Mosal uh, aluminium project, you will see that in relation to, to those uh, projects, you have other facilities and utilities uh, developed, including uh, corporate health facilities. What companies working in those countries have, have learned is that, that as you develop those facilities, it has an impact on the surrounding population. There is a, a, a challenge. You get what we call islands of affluence. You need, if you want to run an operation at certain standards, you need to, to, to have good facilities for your people, uh, good health facilities. Uh, you get a gradient, perhaps, away from the facility, which results in, in migration towards the facility. And that means that around these centers of activity, just as in, in uh, uh, big cities, you draw populations, migration to people where they see maybe not much of a better life, but a tiny bit better life. And if that's, and it's 
negative consequences that are to be addressed. We have to do something about flattening out the gradient, improving the delivery further away from the, uh, the, the corporate activity. And in Anglo, uh, when we've been looking at over many years, uh, in all the mines we have health facilities. And health, of course, mosquitoes don't stop at the mine fence. Uh, they fly around. So if you want an anti-malaria program, it has to go out into the community. And when you come to, to AIDS, AIDS does not stop with the, with the worker. There is the worker's family. And in, in many parts of the world, of course, the worker's family is, is a flexible and highly extendable thing so, and very difficult to, to define. Clearly, the corporation has a responsibility for the worker. I believe clearly we have a responsibility for, for our people's families. But the responsibility cannot stop there. What about you know, the neighbors of, of, of those uh, people? And that's where you become aware of the fact that corporations, when delivering programs, and in Anglo we started this program, and I would say it's actually the antiretroviral. We've had an AIDS program for, for many years, a, a, a prevention program been delivering antiretrovirals for more than a year now. The program is on course, but if you're going to put it in, in place as a, as in a systematic corporate way, training the doctors, more than 70 doctors, all the nurses, all the measurement systems you need to make sure, all the tracking systems to see how it's working, all of those are, are going, but they take uh, time, quite a considerable amount of time. They're working, they're on, on track, but even with that, it takes two, three years to get it right fully up, up to, to speed. To get the people who are not yet actually needing antiretrovirals, we've, we are delivering about a thousand, uh, to about a thousand people, probably three thousand need it. We're more or less on the track that we expected. But the, there are 30,000 people, we reckon, infected. Uh, and we only have 3,000 of those on wellness programs so far. This is going to take another couple of years, probably. When we talk about the community, we can only do it in conjunction with, with others. No corporation can take on responsibility for an entire community, an entire region. Yet, if we don't address it like that, and that's why we've been doing work with the, with the uh, Global Fund. And that, too, I think Richard will say something, something about that. It's just uh, uh, one more thing that I'd, I'd like to say. This is not just about money. It really is, as, as Bill said, about capacity. Uh, let me give you an example. I'm involved in the the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, which happens actually to be funded uh, some of the research. This is a world-class institute founded in the previous period of globalization uh, in Liverpool, a great trading center. Uh, it, it has research which incidentally is funded uh, by the US Department of Health through the National Institute of Health. It gets support from the, the Gates Foundation. It does, apart from work on AIDS and malaria, work on something called lymphatic filariasis. This is, you know, swelling feet, but not just feet, uh, genitals and, and so on. In many African countries, this has 25% incidence. It can be fixed by two pills taken once a year. Two pills once a year to the population for five years. Those pills, through GlaxoSmithKline, are available free. So the drug is free. You need to take two pills once a year for five years. And so it's not a question of cost, it's a question of capacity. And it's taking a long time just to get that delivered. So I think we need to think about that. If, if, if you go from two pills once a year to antiretrovirals continuously, that's a, a, a big jump. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Richard Feacham has been in the field of global public health all his life in so many different leadership capacities, and he has a rich set of experiences. 
right now, as you know, he is uh, leading the Global Fund and right from its inception and got it off to a great running start. Dr. Feacham. Well, thank you, Rajat, and uh, good, good morning, everyone. Um, I think I'm going to start by picking up where Mark left off um, with that story about uh, lymphatic filariasis, elephantiasis. And of course, what he said is absolutely true. And the message from that is that we're just not doing what we know how to do. It's extraordinary the degree to which we're not doing what we know how to do. And that applies to elephantiasis, it applies to malaria, it applies to HIV AIDS, it applies to pediatric diarrhea. You can go on and on. The big killers of poverty. We need the research, as Bill has said, for better tools. But we have a good set of tools already, and we're just not delivering them at scale. And I think that 2004, 2005 must be and will be the years when we get serious, when we go to the massive scale up of known of known interventions. And that leads me into a few of Rajat's challenges, which I want, to <clears throat> I want to pick up on. The first is capacity. The skeptics tell us that we can't do the massive scale up. We can't do the front loading of action because there isn't the capacity. And I think they are partly wrong. And let me just give our experience from the Global Fund in that area of capacity. The first is whose capacity are you talking about? And the trick is to invest in everybody's capacity, not just the public sector's capacity. Around the world, there is huge capacity outside the public sector. 50% of global fund investments are going to faith-based organizations. We're investing in the Catholic church uh, systems, Protestant churches. We're investing in Buddhist organizations in Thailand. My wife urges me to invest in Hindu organizations in India. We will as soon as they make us a good proposal. The faith-based organizations have capacity. We are investing in it. We should invest more in it. They can do more. The NGOs, we're investing in the NGOs. They can do a lot more. And the Global Fund already has the experience that when you put significant finance into a well-organized and committed NGO, things happen very quickly typically much more quickly than when you invest in government programs because government bureaucracies tend to move more slowly. And then there is the corporations, as Mark said, and Anglo-American and other South African corporations, uh, ESCOM, Daimler Chrysler, um, uh, others have, have, have led the way in this arena. And the model of co-investment is one which the Global Fund is very excited about, and Anglo is our first partner in co-investment. The corporation commits to providing prevention and treatment for its workforce and the immediate family, as Mark said. The Global Fund commits to financing the expansion of those investments to the community in which that corporation is operating. We think this is an excellent model, and we see the way in which, in South Africa particularly, corporate action has led the way and has brought government policy changes in its wake. And I hope we're going to see the same in India and other places around the world. But the second point about capacity, I think, is that there is capacity out there which could do a lot more tomorrow if it had the finance. Uh, in the trip that uh, Tommy Thompson and uh, Randall Tobias led around Africa, we saw people dying in clinics just because the drugs weren't in the cupboard. Don't talk about absorption capacity. You buy the drugs, you put them in the cupboard, you give them to the people, the people live. I say again, we saw people dying in good clinics with good doctors and good nurses just because the right drug wasn't in the drug cupboard. There is capacity ready to be invested in, and it will keep people alive. But thirdly, and this is where the capacity skeptics have some truth in what they say, we need the long-term investment in the building of capacity, in, in physical infrastructure and in human infrastructure. We need to train. We need to stop the incredible... Uh, um, uh, bleeding of nurses out of the Caribbean and out of African countries to the UK and the US and Canada. We've got to stop this nurse drain and do something about that. The number of skilled nurses in a number of African countries is declining rapidly as a result of this. We have to put a stop to that. So a variety of investments in medium and long-term capacity are definitely needed, but there's a lot we can do tomorrow notwithstanding that. 
The second point I want to quickly comment on is uh, Rajat's point about the gap in needs. He said we have raised a lot of new money, and we have. Uh, the Global Fund now has $4.3 billion in assets through to 2008. But it isn't anything like enough. We do need a lot more money. The Global Fund, just to take our example, we need $1.6 billion in income in 2004. Mm -hmm. We're close to that. That's not going to be an insurmountable, object, uh, insurmountable objective. But in 2005, we need $3.6 billion. And by 2007, 2008, we need to be at a cruising altitude of seven or eight billion dollars a year of income and expenditure. Otherwise, we can't do what we were set up to do. Those are big challenges. Those are numbers well above current <laughs> thinking in the development assistance field and in development finance. And that's why we need innovation in development finance. We need innovation in ways to collect money from individual citizens and the private sector and we also need innovation in public sector fundraising for development finance. And I believe that Gordon Brown's international finance facility is actually a winner in terms of front-loading front -loading of development finance. France has now committed to that. Other nations, I think, will. We need the IFF if we're going to sustain the pace. We also need, by the way, the reallocation of European development uh, fund money in a more productive way. There's $10 billion of old stuck EDF sitting in Brussels that isn't being spent. That's a scandal. We need to reallocate that to more effective uh, financing channels. Thirdly, let me just say a word about <clears throat> has AIDS crowded out other parts of the health agenda? Um, clearly, there is a, a, a global movement around HIV AIDS, and there is huge political activism around HIV AIDS. And there is a danger that HIV AIDS would, would crowd out or will crowd out um, other important priorities. But I think there are two bits of good news here. One is that HIV AIDS is a priority beyond all others. So a bit of crowding out is appropriate because it's the worst disaster in recorded human history. We've seen nothing like it in the last 5,000 years. It is absolutely unparalleled. And to give it special prominence is absolutely right. But Malaria and TB certainly are riding on the coattails of HIV AIDS. The Global Fund has substantially increased investment in malaria, and that's been brought about because of the commitment to HIV AIDS. So it's been good for malaria. And malaria is a huge priority. Malaria is killing 20, malaria is responsible for a quarter to 30% of all under five deaths uh, in Africa. It's by far the largest killer of African children. Malaria really matters and it's getting worse. Malaria has benefited through the Global Fund from the commitment to HIV AIDS. And finally, let me just pick up on, on Bill, <coughs> Bill's commitment to, uh, to research, which is incredibly important. It's incredibly important that the Gates Foundation continues to invest in research to bring us new products. In AIDS, TB, and malaria, we need better drugs, we need better diagnostics, and we desperately need a vaccine, and we don't have a vaccine for any one of our three diseases. The research is really critical. The kind of upstream investments that Bill is making, critical. The R&D investments by the pharmaceutical industry, absolutely critical. And that's why intellectual property matters, and it's why profitability in the industry has to be maintained. But thirdly, the Global Fund can play a role. And let me mention two dimensions of that. Firstly, we can and we're willing to invest in preparedness for a vaccine, in preparedness for trials. And we've just committed to invest in keeping people who volunteer for trials and who become HIV positive during a trial on antiretroviral therapy for the rest of their lives. That's an important commitment because it's very hard for the people who fund the research to find the money to make that commitment. <coughs> Secondly, I think the Global Fund represents a big pull factor a major contribution to the demand side. When somebody brings a new drug to the marketplace and it works, we'll buy a lot of it. When Bill's investments in IAVI bring us a, a, an HIV AIDS vaccine, and that will be the greatest day in my lifetime, we will buy a lot of it with Galvi. So the money is there to rapidly get the new products to the people who need them because we now have the purchasing power that we didn't have before. Thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, <clears throat> now it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome President Chisano.
and ask him to uh, make his opening remarks. Obviously, uh, this would be very interesting from the perspective of a country in Africa with enlightened leadership and a lot of programs, but I'm also sure a lot of challenges in the area of health. President Chisana. Thank you very much. Indeed, health is one of uh, uh, the priority sectors in the government of uh, Mozambique in its strategy to, to reduce poverty. Uh, we are allo allocating uh, of the total expenditure about 15%. Uh, it's, it's still low, but we have other priorities like education, which uh, has to go along with health. I would say it's true that uh, one of the challenges we are facing is the one which was referred by Bill, uh, that uh, uh, we, although we are a 27 years old, uh, 28 year old country, uh, as an independent country, uh, we, we still have shortage of personnel. And the reason is that we're at independence, there were not 20 doctors. Mozambican doctors in, 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 in the city, there were eight. And so uh, if you found 20 in the city, then uh, you, you found a lot m more. Uh, so uh, the capacity building is still uh, a, a, a challenge in, in the sector of health. We were to introduce the anti uh, retrovirals and one of the obstacles was uh, ex exactly that we didn't have personnel to deal with this. So the first phase was to, to train personnel, to train the personnel to create the, the conditions for laboratories and so on. And now we have uh, started, and uh, I think we started uh, in a, a very firm uh, way. Uh, but it's uh, also uh, true that we, we, we should not wait for all these conditions to, to come together. We, we have to mobilize all resources, and uh, this is what we are doing. To combat uh, uh, HIV, to combat malaria, uh, we call the whole society to come together, the private sector, the government, and the civil society, NGOs, to come together. And we have the problem of management of all the, the activity. Now we are uh, uh, going through a coordinated approach among donors, and the donors not to consider uh, their activity in isolation, but to come together with the other donors and uh, uh, coordinate, uh, including uh, to ensure uh, transparency in what we are doing, uh, accountability. Uh, so it's a, the, 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 for instance, the um, auditing process is not uh, country by country, donor by donor, but it's uh, now being coordinated. And this is bringing in a, a, a higher confidence uh, between the donors and we as recipients. Um, we may say that the, the execution of available funds is low, uh, uh, accounting for between 70 and 80 percent of total funding, with large disparities between source of funding and execu executing institutions. Among the reasons for low budget execution, late disbursement of funds, low capacity of public sector account accountants, cumbersome accounting procedures, and lack of liquidity of treasury are the most common. Uh, well, uh, I'm trying just to make this a short introduction, yeah. but uh, I, would, I would touch uh, on uh, the issue of um, trials, which was mentioned mm -hmm. by doc the doctor there. We, I, I am releasing my prime minister from his functions now so that he dedicates uh, uh, together uh, with the other 
uh, scientists from Africa and uh, the European, with the support of the European Union, uh, attention to the trials in Africa. We in Mozambique, we have a center of research for vaccines uh, for, uh, against, uh, against malaria in a, a, a town called Manisa. Uh, and uh, we, we, because we believe that the malaria is a, 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 the major killer in, in, in Mozambique. We cannot say that AIDS is not the killer uh, because we know that mal malaria takes advantage of the weak bodies who are affected by, malaria, by AIDS. So uh, we have to deal with both uh, at the same time uh, with the same intensity. Uh, actually, I'm glad that now people here in Davos are speaking more and more about the uh, the three diseases at the same time, malaria, tuberculosis, and, uh, and AIDS. But the first time I participated in a panel here, when I, uh, we were told to address our attention to AIDS, and I diverted from that, I started speaking about all other diseases. And they say, no, this is not the subject. I said, no, precisely this is the subject. Thank you. <laughs> because uh, uh, the, in... in uh, in uh, our countries, uh, uh, it's, the tuberculosis is uh, still a problem and the malaria is still a, a problem. Uh, and therefore, those who suffer from AIDS are uh, immediately uh, killed by those uh, two diseases. Well, I also would like to to, to say uh, something about, uh, about uh, the cooperation with the private sector. <coughs> uh, and uh, the example of Mosal was put forward. Uh, actually, we are undertaking a vast program of combat uh, malaria, to combat malaria uh, around the perimeter of uh, the uh, company it's a, a, an aluminum smelter. Uh, and, uh, but we are liaising with South Africa and Swaziland. It's not just a, 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 a confined to Mozambique because malaria, like AIDS, cannot be uh, combated in only one country. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to, uh, to go to beyond that. Uh, in our case, we have these corridors linking our country to the interland countries, uh, which are the most affected areas of, by, by, by AIDS. Uh, so we have to work with the, all, all, all the other countries. In the case of malaria, uh, we are having this special program in South and with very, very good results and with the participation of, uh, of, uh, of Mosul. But there are other companies also who are called to take uh, part in this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to um, ask Secretary Thompson, before uh, he opens his, uh, with his comments, I'd like to first uh, thank him. And I was reminding him last night that at this forum, he uh, uh, made the decision to lead the Global Fund and become the chair of it, which was an unprecedented step for a cabinet uh, <coughs> official to do that, and we have benefited from that leadership. Uh, of course, uh, we all know about the President's program and uh, Secretary Thompson's uh, leadership and support of making that program happen. Uh, he, has, uh, he is extremely committed to this field, uh, exemplified by his many trips and his recent trip to all over Africa. So Secretary Thompson, we look forward to your comments. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Roger. I, you know, I was sitting here listening to all of the speakers, and I was, um, first off, very impressed. But I looked out in the audience, and I was more impressed. I was more impressed because at the World Economic Forum, the health issues really have not had a central role. And I, for one, believe that that's been a mistake. When I look out over the past couple of years, when I've been Secretary of Health and Human Services, 
We've had SARS. We've had a smallpox worry. We've had monkeypox. We have now the resurgence of SARS, possibly in several Asian countries. We have also avian flu. And all of these diseases have had a tremendous impact on every corporation in this room. And every corporation needs to realize that you have got to play a very valuable role if we are going to be able to control, defeat, and really do the job necessary to improve the quality of health. I also think that health should play a much more of a prominent role in international relations. When I travel internationally, there's one common denominator, whether you come from Mozambique, Botswana, China, and Japan, it is the health care of the individuals in that country. And you can be very pessimistic when you look out over the world. You find out the fact that this past year, three million people died of AIDS. But more importantly, and the worst statistic is, five million more came down with HIV AIDS. And you would look at those figures and you would say, the problem is so large. What can we do? Do we have to do anything or will this problem go away? This problem's not going to go away. It's going to get worse unless all of us are committed as a worldwide community through a world economic forum or whatever capacity to do our part in order to improve it. And I happen to be very optimistic. I come from a very poor rural background. My po population, my community I grew up in was 1,500, no stop and go lights. And you, know, you have to be optimistic because you just get up in the morning. When you call somebody, you get a wrong number, you still talk for half an hour. That's how small my community is. So I'm internally an optimistic person. Then I look around and I, I see what tremendous things and assets are available. It's a daunting task, there's no question about it, but I happen to be optimistic. I look out and I see Bill Gates putting in millions of dollars for research. I also look out and see what my country, the United States of America, is doing in research. Billions of dollars for vaccines. And hopefully to be able to defeat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. We're not there yet, but money's being invested. You can argue about the fact that it's not enough, but the effort is there. Then I take a look at what the president has done. The president's come out with an initiative of $15 billion. $3 billion a year for five years. $10 billion of new dollars. And this money is going to go out very rapidly. We have to make sure that the money goes out in an accountable, responsible, transparent way. Because the worst thing that would happen is if there would be some money that was not getting to the proper sources and used for the proper reasons. So we have to be very careful. And then I look at my own department. We are in 87 countries, my Department of Health and Human Services, setting up great programs. And I travel all over the world and go into those programs and give people the encouragement and, you know, the suggestions that they are doing the right thing. Then I look at the Global Fund. In 24 months, ladies and gentlemen, this was an idea, an idea of Kofi Annan's that was uh, the United States came in with the first installment of $200 million. But we've grown from nothing to a corporation of almost $5 billion in 24 months. Do you know of any corporation in the world that has grown to that size in 24 months? I don't. We're in 121 countries with 225 programs. And we have set up a country coordinating mechanism and local financing authorities so that we can make sure that the money is spent properly and it's transparent. You can watch us and on your website, just watch up and see the progress and the kind of investments that we're making. And then I talked in my capacity as a board member of the World Health Organization. And we want to we want to give three million people antiretroviral drugs in the next five years. And I was just at the board meeting in Geneva this week, and we're redoubling our efforts to eradicate polio. 
in the year 2004 and 2005 and get it out of the world's uh, lexicon as a disease. Tremendous progress. Oh, there is much more to do. And this, and this economic forum is a primary source of mobilizing that kind of support and the kind of things that are happening. And when I went to Africa, we went to five countries. We went to Cameroon and Zambia and Rwanda. We went to a, a faith organization run by the Catholics in Gambi. 600,000 people are served by this organization. A hospital that has a bed capacity of 350, but attendance of over 410 each and every day. And they're doing it with just a, a minuscule amount of money, but they're offering hope. Then I went out to Tororo, which is a small village four hours by bus outside of Kampala, Uganda. And then we had to get on motorcycles to deliver the antiretroviral drugs on paths that uh, are impassable by vehicles. And we went out and we split up the group. We had 103 high-ranking officials, and we all went to two families. I went to two families. The first one was Rosemary. And I want to quickly tell you these stories in conclusion. Rosemary husband died in 94 with AIDS, leaving her HIV positive and four children. Her brother died in 95, leaving her with three more children and an elderly mother. She lives on the equator. She raises food on two acres of land that she rents or squats from her brother-in-law. She makes $70 a year. She was on her deathbed in 2001. And my CDC started giving her antiretroviral drugs. She's back, somewhat healthy, full of the devil, articulate, beautiful woman. And she took me into her hut, which is a mud hut, that they sleep on the, on the dirt with her seven children. And she says, thank you and thank America. Thanks, CDC, for giving me hope. And then I went to a carpenter by the name of Samson. And Samson goes down in the swamp every day, drags up wood, brings it up in which he turns that wood after he dries it into tables and chairs, which he sells for a buck and a half to two bucks a piece. And he makes $7 a week. And he buried his wife in 2001, right outside the front door. And he did this so he could show his children what happens with risky behavior and how important it is to prevent HIV AIDS. And then he told me that he is going to send his children to school as long as he possibly can. But he was worried because he only makes such a small amount of money and it requires $60 a year to send his daughter to school after she reaches 12. I gave him $100 so that he could be able to send her next year. And he thanked me. But more than that, he thanked the United States, the Global Fund, for the opportunity to live. And that's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. There's an optimism in Africa that I haven't seen before. It's because of the President's initiative. It's from the Global Fund. It's what corporations are doing. It's what NGOs are finally doing. For the first time in a long time, we're all coordinating our efforts somewhat, not good enough, but we are doing things necessary to give the people in Africa hope. And if we don't do it and start controlling these diseases in Africa, the next step is India, then China. And if we don't control it there, I don't know what's going to happen. That's why corporations, the economic forum, and every one of us cannot look back. We cannot be in bystanders. We have to be engaged in this fight. This is a war, ladies and gentlemen, and every one of us have to be involved. And the capacity is necessary. And you, when you go back home, you sit on hospital boards, you are connected with universities. 
What we really need is you to help us build the capacity to set up an opportunity to match a hospital, to match a hospital in Africa, to teach them how to treat patients, give them the education, and treat the nurses and educate the doctors, but not to keep them in our countries, but to send them back to Africa where the need is so important. So with the research that's being done by Gates and by other organizations such as my own, the National Institutes of Health, with the organizations being built up, with a newfound degree of involvement of the World Economic Forum and corporations all over the world, and with a newfound optimism, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a much better chance than we have in a long time. Thank you, and thank you for being involved. <clears throat> We, um, we, we have about 10 to 15 minutes. Maybe we can get some rapid fire um, kind of questions and answers from the panel. May I just uh, actually very quickly ask one question, which is I'd say, if I'd ask the panel, what are the one or two things specifically you would do differently to enhance the returns and the investments we're making on health? News is good, but what are the one thing or two things we change? Mark, can I just, it, 30 second answers, I'll just go whoever has to contribute and then we'll open the questions to the floor. Yeah, I think it's clearly cooperation between companies which is happening, but also co cooperation between companies and, and civil society organizations and integration of, of uh, to get efficiency out of the system. Richard, you have a... Uh, I, I think we need improved management capacity to ensure rapid implementation. Well, I have said it already, uh, it's uh, the transition from a partnership system based on the direct financing of activities and our programs towards a sector-wide approach, which uh, has proved to be a good thing in, uh, in, in Mozambique. Secretary Thompson. Corporations, cooperation, partnerships, investments, leadership of public leaders in the countries that are doing the best in Africa. It's been because presidents like the president of Mozambique who's here, President Museveni in Uganda, and other presidents are taking the lead in making sure that their countries are aware of the prevention and the necessity of looking out for prevention. Bill, you're known for pointing out things that we haven't yet figured out, so tell us what you would do different one or two things. Well, I think <clears throat> the scientific advances are what will let us turn the tide. But uh, the thing I'd, I'd point out is that as great as all these uh, efforts were to raise visibility and get funds, unless we get real grassroots support for these health issues, I think it will be hard to sustain. You know, there will be mistakes. There will be setbacks. And we need a broad political commitment. And uh, so the issues need a lot more visibility, whether it's in the rich countries where the money comes from or uh, the political leadership in the countries where the, the crisis exists. Good. A few questions from the field, please. Yes, uh, not a question, but a uh, comment. Question. Then short. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, an expression of gratitude on behalf of people living with AIDS uh, in my continent for the response that the world has given and the generosity of people like Bill Gates and the United States and the Global Fund uh, in giving hope to the people who are living with AIDS. Thank you very much. Uh, in my mother tongue, uh, which means do not tire of well-doing, but do better next time. Let's stiffen our spines uh, in dealing with this. And secondly, to uh, confirm what Richard has said about capacity. There is capacity in the broad church of civil society organizations and speaking on behalf of faith-based communities. I think that we are strategically placed and we are very committed uh, to uh, make, to give of our best uh, in the fight against AIDS. Uh, faith-based communities cover every square inch uh, in terms of every country. And as Stephen Lewis has said, 
Uh, it is one institution, faith-based communities, one institution in Africa that reaches everyone at least once, uh, once uh, a week. And uh, what is uh, proposed uh, in my part of the world is that we as churches, my church in particular, should begin to set up one-stop uh, healthcare centers where there would be a, a, a medication to ensure that the people receive, take the medic medication, that there's nutrition, that people do get tested, and that these are AIDS-friendly centers where people can get support, love, and care. I thank you. Thank you. Over there. <clears throat> My name is Ed Scott. I'm uh, uh, <clears throat> chairman of a thing called the Friends of the Global Fund, and uh, we exist to do what Bill said, which is to <clears throat> get broad visibility and support, public support, and support from the body politic for this issue. Um, uh, I happen to have the good fortune to be with Secretary Thompson on his trip, and I can tell you <clears throat> no one could have gone on those visits in Tororo and not be a zealot about this issue. Uh, that was one of the most moving things you could have participated in. My question is, um, and this is to really the Secretary Richard and Bill, is anybody funding, I mean we talk about capacity and uh, I'm convinced from everything I read, everyone I talk to, and everything I saw in that brief time, that this capacity thing is not a phony issue. It's a real issue. Scaling up, getting things out there, Getting the doctors, getting the medical technicians trained, uh, is, and, the, and the infrastructure, the roads, and everything else, it's just a nightmare. So has anybody done an inventory? Is anybody funding an inventory of what the capacity issue really is, country by country, region by region, city by city, and identified the choke points so that we can decide what has to be funded to build up the capacity. We've been thinking uh, up to this point, funding the price of the medicine, uh, funding the vaccine research, uh, funding a lot of other areas, but now I think we need to be thinking about how do we fund the capacity building, and you can't do that unless you know where the issue is. So is anybody doing that? Anybody has a particular response to it? There's no overall, to the best of my knowledge, there's no overall a survey of uh, the continent of Africa where the choke points are. Uh, what happens in country and in region, uh, there are surveys done by CDC and by other uh, uh, non-governmental organizations like USAID, or government organizations like USAID, that uh, have tremendous uh, uh, assets on, on the ground there that have done inventories of what they need. But instead of an overall assessment, I don't know of any. Yeah. There's certainly an awareness of how many doctors are in these countries, uh, and that's a fairly bleak picture. There's really only one country that creates a lot of doctors and sends them to poor countries, and that's Cuba. Uh, it's kind of fantastic that they've done that, and uh, certainly it's a resource that, that needs to be tapped into. One thing that is very interesting is that uh, some of the Global Fund recipients are trying models that are less intense in terms of specialist time. Uh, I particularly mention what Paul Farmer is doing in Haiti where he's been able to keep it quite simple. Uh, and so there is some hope that the amount of professional doctor time, uh, professional nurse time, can actually be brought uh, way, way below what is typically done in rich countries for these drug regimes. Mark, you had a quick... Yeah, I would just say logistically, if you want to know where the choke points are, Coca-Cola, Heineken, etc., etc., they're delivering it, and they will deliver it on motorbikes if need be. Back over there. <clears throat> yes, Laurie Garrett from the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I have a question regarding what we're, we're really building towards. We've got this very exciting moment now where all of a sudden we have money, we have global leadership, we have the United States government on board at the highest levels, etc. Um, but the biggest mistake we made with smallpox eradication was to walk away from the entire infrastructure we had built in nation by nation uh, in public health to eradicate smallpox. And so the question really is since 
We can't start treating people and then five years from now say, oops, we're not interested anymore in the world community. We're not going to give the money anymore. You guys are all going off drug. So if we're going to start this thing, we're in it for 50 years, 70 years, a mounting toll, however long it takes. So theoretically, we're building up a big long-term infrastructure. So my real question, and, and I want to especially address this to President Chisano, is that are we thinking now about how the infrastructure we'll, we're building up specifically for antiretrovirals, for malaria, and for tuberculosis is going to translate into uh, long-term health needs, long-term health infrastructure. And another very key piece of this, which has been brought up um, by uh, Grasa Michelle Mandela, one of the most important figures in the history of your nation, uh, is HIV is a women's disease increasingly in Africa, and countries that are providing more rights to women more financial capacity to women, are beginning to see some turning in that tide. Do you see also as part of this, as a corollary to this, building a long-standing permanent difference in the status of women in African countries and the, st and the rights and privileges of women? Well, you, you have put uh, many questions in one. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I'll try to to answer very shortly by saying that uh, we in Mozambique have a, a, a global approach to matters of health. Uh, many times we are compelled to speak about HIV or malaria, but uh, we don't see how to separate uh, the combat against all these diseases from the uh, the basic, basic medical care, the primary health care, because it's from what there that we, we start preventing disease. And women are, in the, are central in this. We have a, a special service for to maternal and infant, uh, and mother and child care. And uh, this leads us to other aspects of dealing with women. Their promotion, their empowerment, uh, the, the attention we give to, to women in education, and so on. Therefore, it's very difficult to separate all these aspects. When we speak about infrastructure, again, we don't think only about a hospital, but we think about the road which can lead to that hospital where Coca-Cola can drive his car to, to, to take medicines, where the doctors can travel, where an ambulance can pass, where people can sell their products because food and health are related. So when we speak about the infrastructure for health, we are speaking about a lot of things. Uh, a while ago, a, a question was made whether there is a, any evaluation of what needs to be done. Well, in Mozambique, we know what ought to be done now. There's a lot to be done, but we set priorities. And uh, uh, so we are, we are working in that, this direction. A lot of infrastructure has to be done. We cannot do all at the same time because the resources are not enough. Uh, but we have priorities. And these things which I mentioned are infrastructures we are taking one by one. I spoke about laboratories. I spoke about, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, 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 um, the, the, the voluntary uh, testing uh, posts, uh, and so on. These are infrastructures, small infrastructures, but which are of a very big importance. Uh, but you cannot also deal with these diseases in these small places without having central hospitals or provincial hospitals who are backing them. Great. 
Secretary. First part of your question, your, your preamble to before you ask the question, as to whether or not the commitment is there to stay in place and continue to build the infrastructure. I personally believe that the world community is thirsting uh, for new policy directions, foreign policy directions based around health. And I really sincerely believe that once you start building the infrastructure around health, you tear down more barriers than in any other arena. And that's why I think the potential is there. I can't promise you that it's going to continue, but at this moment, I think we have a great opportunity to use health diplomacy as a way to build better civility around the world, better opportunities for citizens. And that's why I am certainly pleased and optimistic and committed to accomplish that, uh, that transformation of, uh, of diplomacy. Uh, I must say that uh, we are running out of time. Obviously, this is a topic we could have spent not one hour, but a day at least, or even several days. And uh, I'm sure we will do that in different forums. I want to just highlight, uh, let me just make one comment that the Congress Hall is full for uh, Vice President Cheney's address, so the best uh, opportunity for you to do that would be to stay right here and it will be screened on the TV here. So people who are trying to go and get into the Congress Hall, it is full, just uh, stay here and listen to the Vice President. Um, I want to just take this opportunity to uh, thank all the panelists. Uh, for their valuable contributions. I took away from it. Capacity is a big issue. We're going to take not only a narrow view, but a holistic view, including women's empowerment. Private resources are key to it, in, in, in addition to public resources, and real coordination between all these programs. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you for the panel.